Well, this morning we have come to an especially pastoral moment in Jesus' journey. News had come to him concerning the slaughter of some of his Galilean neighbors who had been murdered by Pilate as they were making sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. And in a particular sacrilegious display, they had their blood mingled with the blood of the sacrificial animals. Brutality and sacrilege are not just symptoms of the modern or postmodern world, it seems. Of course, Jesus anticipated the framing question of those who brought him the news. What did these poor souls do to deserve such a fate? You know, we human beings can tend to, to go to that place when we are confronted with tragedy, especially when it happens to us or to someone that we love, someone close to us. We hear echoes of it among Job's friends, for instance, as his world was falling apart. One of Job's friends said to him, As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. If you will seek God and make supplications to the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore your rightful place, said another of Job's friends. Yet another chimed in, Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. In other words, it could have been worse. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? There seems to be some human inclination that when we encounter a demonstrable effect out there in the world, there must be an explainable cause that we are somehow missing and need to go in search of. I mean, how many talking heads out there have been speculating on why, on why Putin made the decision to instigate a war with Ukraine, for example? I just saw a headline this morning in the BBC. Why is Putin doing this sort of thing? Something within us wants to understand. Yet we cannot know. We can listen to his rhetoric, but only he knows what truly motivated him to rain down such death and destruction upon the people of Ukraine. Why did Pilate do what he did? Only Pilate can answer that question. So in the face of the unknown cause, the people who confronted Jesus had made the assumption that somehow the people Pilate slaughtered must have deserved it. They were, they were bigger sinners than everybody else. Well, Jesus looked at them and he simply said, No, your calculus is all messed up. You see, in that encounter, Jesus rejected our human tendency to look for simplistic answers to deep and complex questions. In the words of our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, I'll quote him in this text, Jesus says no to their attempts to solve their deep troubles and quick fixes, and no to shallow theological thinking. What Pilate let loose were consequences that not even he could have anticipated. The same can be said of Putin's war. What has been unleashed on the Ukrainian people now has its own trajectory. This is what happens when unbridled evil is let out of the bottle and why we must take such great care not to let it out into the world. So as pastoral as Jesus was, trying to help these people grasp the truth of God's great mercy, he also set them on a mission. Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they are, were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Please don't hear that as judgment. It's not judgment. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to follow where Jesus leads. Jesus then went on to tell a parable about a gardener determined to tend a fruitless fig tree because as the gardener, 
She was open to a future possibility that she did not control or manage. Again, in the words of Michael Curry, facing the reality of mystery and the limits of what we can know is not an excuse to stand still and look sad. Jesus is on a mission. Those who would be disciples of Jesus, who would follow in his way in the power of his spirit, are on the mission. Much is unknown. Many questions will remain unanswered. In the end, the future is God's. But we share in the mission of unfolding the future. This is clearly our responsibility. The working out of God's kingdom is not ours to figure out. Our task is to labor without having all the answers, to acknowledge the deep mystery of it all. The task of the disciple is to take our best step and leave the rest to God. We labor now for a future we are not meant to control. We labor now for a future we are not meant to control. I want that to sink in for a bit. It is important not to take the parable of the fig tree too allegorically, but suffice it to say that you and I are gardeners. We don't own the vineyard or make the decision about when to cut the tree down. Our role is to stand on the side of life, to stand on the side of hope, and to do our part by lovingly tending and nurturing that life. And then let it go and let God do the rest. Roman Catholic Archbishop Oscar Romero, who many of you know is a personal hero of mine, has a prayer attributed to him that many of you know. I've used it before. But he captures this so well. And so I want to conclude with this prayer of Romero's this morning. It helps now and then to, to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives include everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and to do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that's the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Amen and amen.